Good afternoon, everyone. Came across an article in Zero Hedge interviewing Jim Rogers about the coming water wars, and I'm wondering why the discussion of war would precede the discussion of primary water from the mantle of our earth replenishing our aquifers, which we could drill directly into and pump that water out. National Geographic, the inner earth holds more water than all the seas combined. There's solid information now linked to subduction zones pulling seawater down into the mantle that gets recycled and comes back up through our volcanoes. Also, every beach across the entire world, all the coastlines, that sand and porous limestone is nothing but a large filter to take the salt water out. Anywhere you see a natural spring, a hot spring, these are the breakthrough zones where the primary water actually has enough pressure to push outward. There should not be a lack of water and scarcity on this planet. And I would like to open the discussion here on why we're not taking a look at primary water sources. You can't go a day in the news now without hearing about a drought somewhere on our planet. Jim Rogers gives a nice interview in Zero Hedge talking about water problems and his investment plays for future water wars and constraints in water production. Now what's not talked about is the primary water source from the mantle of our earth. We know about secondary water cycles. These are from rain, evaporation that come back down and then filter through the porous rock bed and down into the aquifers. Nobody ever talks about those aquifers being replenished from beneath through primary water sources that exist naturally in our mantle. We live on a water planet. It's a new report out from Japan talking about how the Earth's conveyor belt of subduction zones pulls so much fluid out of the ocean, desalinates it through heat, and then it gets pushed back up specifically through volcanoes, but also runs through the entire mantle of the Earth and their oceans under our crust. And National Geographic puts that amount at five times as much water under our Earth as there are in all the oceans combined. Now, of course, 400 miles beneath the Earth, there's no way we're going to drill down into that. But the pressure from the mantle pushing that water out is what we want to take a look at. The mantle's that second layer down, that orange layer that resembles lava. There's a zone between the mantle and the upper crust of the Earth where volcanic activity takes place as well as where the aquifers are at. These rock formations have cracks and breaks all through them. How do you think we extract oil out of the ground? Instead of it being an oil well, it's basically a water well, but naturally refilling, we simply need to find out and map those areas and tap directly into them and there is a never-ending supply of water forever for our cities, for our agriculture, but again, it won't be too much of an investment play if it's basically free and unlimited. Secondary water sources is what we base almost all of our economics on currently with water usage, rights, etc. Evaporation from the ocean creates clouds. It rains. The water comes down. The water finds its way through porous cracks. Refills the aquifers. Unfortunately, now we have cities and all these different runoff from streets and homes. It's called a gray funnel. That same water makes it down into the aquifers, so really a lot of aquifers across the planet are not very clean. After that water seeps down through the porous rock, sand, and clay layers down into the aquifer. When we start looking at this really contaminated water that's going around this planet, nuclear radiation up everywhere from the 70 years of exploding and testing, as well as chemicals. NASA's keeping an eye on our freshwater sources on Lake Erie up there. Look at the algae bloom. If we could harvest that algae and turn it into biodiesel, that's a double use of that right there. Clean it up and turn a profit from it. Now, when I'm talking about this porous areas where water from the surface, such as rainwater, seeps back down into the aquifers, you can see there's a lot of cracks, crevices, different kind of gravels, different sedimentary compositions that allow for this slow filtration to slowly refill the aquifers. That's true if you only believe that it's recharged from the surface, but these confining beds at the bottom also have cracks in them, so it's very easy for water to be pushed up through pressure from the mantle of the earth to refill these things from the bottom. 
If you look at the left on there, why is there a spring? If it was recharging from the top, there shouldn't be a spring coming out unless there's pressure somewhere, and that pressure is coming from down in the mantle pushing up. And every time you see one of these diagrams, it's always a confining unit because it's this misnomer that nothing ever recharges from underneath. But I'm saying the aquifers are recharged from beneath by primary water. And again, this lack and scarcity mentality needs to go out the window. Every single coastline across the planet has freshwater aquifers very near the shore. What do you think all that sand and limestone does? It's a giant filter. And I do mean across the coastlines of our entire world, there's a saltwater interface where you get a groundwater table with fresh water. It's continuously refiltering it. This is a schematic from Biscayne Bay in Florida. You can see how the fresh water is flowing through there. And if you take a look at the, the level of the wells, those wells are only a couple hundred feet deep. If they push through that intermediate confining layer there, they will find water beneath that as well. Additionally, they're drilling way too close to the shore. And I've read articles and heard people talking about within 25 miles of the coastline, generally there is a freshwater aquifer table completely surrounding all of our continents, as well as offshore. There's schematic after schematic where the sea meets the beach, and right behind that you get the freshwater aquifer. But drilling offshore would be the same. You would just have to go down a little bit deeper in the offshore aquifers and those would be plentiful as well. The schematic to show you exactly what I mean here, that seafloor is also just one giant filtration unit. Another idea here of Chesapeake Bay. So a global map will give you an idea of how much possible coastline there is to find water, especially in Africa and the Middle East. You're just not utilizing that source to such a great extent there. And did you ever take Time to notice that whenever there's a major volcanic eruption, there's all those mudslides, even though there's not a glacier on top of these volcanoes. Why is that? Well, there's so much water being pushed up from the mantle during the eruption with the magma that you get all those steam plumes and, and flash mud floods. And here was an interesting diagram also showing primary water coming from the ringwoodite reservoir being recharged naturally in the transition zone under the earth there. So there's little bits and pieces of information. So on the map of the world, okay, that's number one spot. We need to look for others. There are others out there. There are millions of them. Wherever you see volcanic rift zones, hot water springs are pushing out of there. That pressure jettisons that water up. And I do not actually mean going into the middle of a national park and throwing pipes down in the ground. 30 to 50 kilometers away from here, you'll find the same things, but at a cooler temperature, that's where you need to be drilling into, not the actual heated water right there in the national parks. And when you do see different springs coming out as rivers, as you do in Florida, again, these are primary water sources. These things are flowing and running continuously. There needs to be a map tracing back to where this little small area is being refilled, goes back into a larger chamber and systems of caverns. And when you can tap into that main system, that main pipe, if you will, that's exactly what we need to be looking for instead of talking about wars to fight for water. We should be using our technology and know-how to go out and find these primary water sources to solve our problems. Every country has enough water that's not being used right now. I would invest in the drilling companies and technology to pull that fresh water and primary water out of the ground. And along on the same front page on Zero Hedge, I tagged this article here showing population. They feel that there'll be a natural population decline because of the lack of births as well as sterility across the planet. That by 2100, the population is going to decline naturally, not increase as the UN has forecast. So with the current population on the planet and the amount of water we have, there's definitely enough for everybody. We just need to go after these primary water sources. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of the video, new and interesting. If you like the information, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Adapt2030.